motion challenging the constitutionality of the Bogri law began in the Supreme Court today but was put off until October amidst a fresh development. Seven church groups have been allowed to intervene by making submissions on the case brought against the government by US-based advocacy group AIDS Free World on behalf of Javed Jagai. Javed Jagai says he was evicted from a house he rented because of his sexual orientation. It really hit me in that moment just how the Bogri law legitimizes and allows for the policing of gay men's bodies, of gay men's lives. It invites the public into our homes to then be adjudicators of what is moral and what is immoral and what is legal and what is legal, despite of the fact that as Jamaican citizens, we have guaranteed right to privacy, to privacy of the home, and it is my firm belief that the Bogri law in its current iteration, which criminalizes consensual intimacy between adults and private, is a violation of that right. That was just one of the reasons the gay rights activist decided to challenge the constitutionality of Jamaica's anti-sodomy laws. Maurice Tomlinson is lead counsel for Javi Jagai. Our contention is that the expanded charter, which has enhanced the right to privacy, overrules and trumps the 1864 colonial law which we inherited from Britain. And so we are asking that the court find that the anti bogle law must be read down to exclude issues of private consensual activity between men. And uh, we fully expect that once all the facts are laid out and the proper interpretation is given to the new charter, it will be so found. Tomlinson works with the international group AIDS Free World and says despite his association with the organization, the challenge to the constitution is not being orchestrated by foreign hands. Javed Jagai says the challenge originated locally and is being done on behalf of all within Jamaica's lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgendered LGBT community. The, the case that is in the court right now is not, is not asking the court to strike down the law. Currently, there is no provision in the Sexual Offences Act to criminalize um, anal rape um, or non-consensual um, anal intimacy. So therefore, the Bogey Law does serve a useful purpose. What we are asking for is for a declaration from the court to say that when this law is, is, is interpreted, it is interpreted to exclude consensual intimacy between adults in private. The Jamaica Forum for Lesbians, All Sexuals and Gays, JFLAG, has joined the suit as a co-claimant, supporting Jagai's challenge. We've joined particularly because of the mounting opposition um, up to the first um, administrative session. There were 13 parties who had joined um, to support the Attorney General in responding to Jagai, and so JFLAG um, felt it necessary to ensure that Jagai had sufficient support and, and also so that the case would get um, what, we've, what we feel would be um, the best possible hearing. The women's group Caribbean Dawn has also been given permission to join the suit as an interested party on Javed Jagai's behalf. The legal and arguably the moral battle lines have been drawn because on the other side, several religious and civil society groups have been given permission to join the suit as interested parties on behalf of the Attorney General's department. Among the religious groups joining the suit is the organization Christians for Truth and Justice. Catholic deacon Peter Espute is a member. We are supporting the government, supporting the constitution, supporting the laws of Jamaica in upholding this attack upon the laws of Jamaica by the, the gay lobby. I think it is a Christian battle because the gay lobby is, take, is attacking the church. Their goals are to overturn, in their words, this is how they would put it, to overturn the hegemony of the church in Jamaica. That things that the church considers normal they consider oppressive and they wish to 
remove Jamaica from the rubric of a Christian country to make it a secular country. The civil society group Jamaica Coalition for a Healthy Society is also standing with the Attorney General's Department against the Javid Jagai challenge, joining as an interested party. The removal of the Bugri law has been shown to be internationally the first step in a process of reorganizing the society such that uh, homosexuality becomes the most important consideration and every other consideration including freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, uh, parental rights are then placed secondary to homosexual interests and, and that's why we thought it was necessary to, to join that, um, that uh, suit as an interesting party. Maurice Saunders is a Catholic deacon and an attorney at law with the Christians for Truth and Justice group. The right to privacy, yes, it's in the Charter of Rights. It's a good charter, it's a good law for having that right in there. But not even the right to privacy is absolute. If you read it, in the Charter you say there are exceptions to it. And exceptions are necessary. Saying that there's consent doesn't really, it might be some mitigating element, but we see the wrong in it. The Christian group, the Love March movement, has also joined as an interested party in support of the Attorney General. We are many times accused of fear mongering, but this is the reality of the situation. When we talk about the repealing of the Bugri law, it makes sense to look at what has happened in other nations. That's not fair manga and that's just the reality that is logical thinking. I mean, I, I don't think we, we expect to change the mind of the gay lobby. Their minds are made up. They are very determined in what they are doing. Um, but there are millions of Jamaicans out there watching. And were the church to just throw their hands up in the air and allow the gay lobby to just have their own way, I think would be not fair to the gospel. The Catholic deacon argues that the real fear for some within the church is that the government may not be too keen to vigorously defend the moral position and that's why the church saw it critical to join the suit. The fear is that the government won't fight it too hard and they'll allow, allow the gay lobby to win. Bearing in mind that the Prime Minister made an announcement during the last campaign that her intention was to look at repealing the Bugri law. But I do believe that um, the, gov the present government is soft on the issue of homosexuality. I would hope that the government develops a backbone and stands up for what is right even in the face of aggressive, hysterical, fear-mongering opposition. I think it is time to come to recognize that gay Jamaicans have always been, will always be, and instead of dismissing us as miscreants and pedophiles and predators, we need to acknowledge the contributions gay Jamaicans have made right. and continue to make and respect our right to exist. Hi, good afternoon. Diana Thomas here again from the Love March Movement. You know, we fast every single Wednesday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's every single Wednesday. And we're asking everybody to support us. If you're a Christian right now, you are being called to war. And we're not talking about grab sword and thing, but grab the spiritual sword. This week's topic, this week's fasting will be on the topic, keep the bug relaxed, prevent social anarchy. The Love March movement is a group of young Christians who say they are dedicated to sexual purity. We were looking into, into society and we saw that sexual immorality was on our rise, homosexuality was on our rise, and many of these things seemingly going unchallenged, right? There was no one really speaking up and there was definitely not a youth voice. Daniel Thomas argues that despite what many critics say, the Love March movement is not only against homosexuality. 
Our vision is to see a Jamaica that is challenged, educated, prayed and loved to sexual purity and the protection of the family. So it's definitely not mainly about homosexuality, but homosexuality is an important part, right? We are standing against that because that represents the main thing that we're defending the country from right now. But there are other things that we're dealing with that are already in the nation. First of all, we definitely do not hate gays, right? We care about all persons, we care about homosexuals, right? We want to see, we want to see persons who struggle with same-sex attractions get over those feelings and, you know, be restored to God in, in, in terms of right relationship and freedom from sin. I don't see this kind of outlash when it comes on to a murderer or a rapist. I don't see the church getting up, placarding, going about on TV, talking about this, because why? They're scared, right? So there's that fear. What is it about homosexuals that causes such a, a deep, passionate drive to see this group extinguished from society. Christine Lewis heads the group Women for Women Jamaica, which caters to the needs of lesbian, bisexual and transgender Jamaican women. She contends that Jamaica's LGBT community is an easy target for local church leaders. While admitting that this won't change anytime soon, she maintains that Javid Jagai's constitutional challenge is a critical step in the Jamaican LGBT fight for equality. When he wins the case, we're all saying that he's going to win the case, it will alleviate some of the pressure that we're currently feeling. Um, we do get pressure from two main areas in society, from religious as well as from the law and the person still are under the impression that homosexuality in Jamaica is illegal. It's not illegal. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like saying somebody can't be straight. So when he wins that case, it will alleviate the, the, the side of legality. We would find that the um, government agents will have to pay a little bit more attention. What we really need is some social change. Um, that, that the societal norms need to shift. Sometimes what we really need is that, that piece of legislation, that, that legal piece um, to support. And we feel that it, is a, it will be a sufficient demonstration um, that you know, there is protection under the Constitution. It does not specifically say non-discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation but that we hope that out of the, the, the court case that um, the interpretation of, of the Constitution will suggest that there is protection for LGBT people, particularly those who are engaged in private consensual acts. Two days before the first case management hearing for the Javed Jagai Constitutional Challenge, the church gathered in Kingston to pray for the nation. One of the major issues which was on the church's prayer agenda was homosexuality and Javid Jagai's challenge. No government has the authority to rebel against God's higher authority by making lawful what God says is unlawful. God says that homosexuality and lesbianism is unlawful and unnatural. Romans chapter 1 verses 26 through 27. This government wants to change the law that forbids homosexual acts. To make matters worse, a homosexual activist is suing this government on Tuesday of this week to try to get the Supreme Court to declare the Anti-Buggery Act unconstitutional. If they succeed. Judging from what has happened in other countries where the anti buggery law has been abolished, they are not going to be content at that. They are going to go back to the court 
to make it a criminal offense to speak against the homosexual lifestyle. The pastor urged the church to pray fervently that the challenge to the Bogwe law would fail. Pray for the lawyers and doctors and other presenters at the court case this Tuesday, June 25, who will be standing up for God, that God may cause their presentations to persuade the judges to conclude that the anti-buggery law is constitutional. Pray that the judges will be God-loving, God-fearing, and God-obeying persons. Pray for the conversion of the homosexual and lesbian community worldwide, and for the conversion of all other sinners, for it is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What concerns the church today is that the homosexuals generally are not repenting, but they are rising up with one voice to take the world over through the court, to try to get the whole world to accept their lifestyle as good. But we cannot do that. We must speak out and we must pray to God that this government does not buckle under pressure, but that they stand up for righteousness. They stand up for godliness and holiness. Maurice Tomlinson admits that there are concerns within the Jamaican LGBT community that there will be some backlash in the wake of the court challenge to Jamaica's anti sodomy laws. When you have the churches making these kinds of irresponsible statements that they're willing to die to prevent human rights for LGBT being recognized in Jamaica, then of course it's going to translate into all sorts of erratic and vicious attacks on LGBT. So yes, they've gone too far, and I don't believe that they have fully taken on board the implications of their words. Words have power. It is really the right of two people to decide to live together and show their love to each other. That is what really engages us and gets us excited and wants us to pour out onto the street and post a hundred comments on a news story. That is what energizes us. I really think we have to reconsider that approach. Most Jamaicans are accustomed to Diana McCauley fighting for environmental preservation. But another cause which is dear to her heart is rights for Jamaica's LGBT community. I mean, it's personal for me because my son is gay and he's a wonderful human being. But every time I look at a story in the media about um, anything to do with gay rights and I look at the comments that people post online, these are comments that I feel are directed at him, at me, and I wanted to speak out about it. I want people to think about their own relatives and friends who are gay and ask themselves, why does it change my mind about this person who was part of my family or part of my circle of friends? Recently, Diana McCauley attended her son's civil union partnership abroad and the environmentalist admits that it was a bittersweet moment as she realized her son would never live in Jamaica again. Your children may not decide to live here for whatever reason. They don't have to be gay to, to decide to migrate. So I'm not saying this is the only reason people decide to live away from Jamaica. But in my son's case, I mean, I think it was a very big part of his decision not to return after he went away from school. And I think that is heartbreaking when the country of your birth essentially rejects you and says you have no contribution to make here. And so I find myself in the position, many mothers are in this position, it's, it's not peculiar to me of, of, you know, seeing my son once a year, one, every other year, which could happen for all kinds of other reasons, but when it happens for the reason that it has happened in my case, which is basically prejudice and bigotry, I find that very hurtful. She argues that the church's stance against homosexuality is one way of justifying its beliefs and prejudices question of choice, it's very important for the church to argue that it is a choice because if it is not a choice, then they have to admit to prejudice, you know. So I think that is why they're reluctant to consider that. The reality is that there has been a lot of fear mongering. There has been what we call um, this need to appeal to some moral panic. Um, why are we talking about gay marriage when marriage is, con is protected under our constitution? 
as one man and one woman. You know, why are we having that discussion? This is because they've seen what's happened across the rest of the world. And instead of allowing for a balanced conversation, they're generating fear in people's hearts about what is to come. What is to come can be decided by the people if we are able to sit and have a rational discussion. Clearly, this, this is but one battle in a much larger war. And um, one, one would be, one would be uh, imprudent were not one to look down the line to see what would be the next challenge. And so were we not to fight, say, this particular battle and give in, then possibly uh, the next battle would be harder to win. A lot of what is presented in Jamaican media is simply uh, remove the buggy law because you shouldn't peep into people's bedroom. But it's much, much more than that. And uh, yes, I think the Jamaican public has not had a comprehensive discussion on what this agenda is seeking to achieve. So I think it's something that we need to look into. And that's one of the reasons the coalition has been speaking, addressing it, because we, we want the public to be informed. The homosexual activists are not content just to remove an anti buggery act. They have something up their sleeves. And they plan as their next step to try to make it a criminal offense for people like me or you to say anything bad about their lifestyle. After that, they plan to go to the court again to make same-sex marriage legal and at the same time to make it a criminal offense for a marriage officer or minister of religion to refuse to marry either two men or two women. A heavy fine will be imposed on church leaders every time they refuse to marry a same-sex couple. The fact that, the fact that um, in, other, in other countries um, they have been able to advance in what is over 30 years of advocacy and to have been able to reach a point of gay marriage is not to say that one day Jamaica wouldn't reach there. Yes? If we're talking about real equality. Not, not equity, but equality before the law. Um, but it is unfair to suggest that this is happening tomorrow and therefore prevent a rational conversation about protecting the rights of LGBT people. Woman and woman cannot increase and develop family. This is a challenge and an affront to God. As the church continues and intensifies its drive to rally support against Java Jagai's constitutional challenge, members of the Love March movement are taken to the streets. The petition to the Prime Minister is a document that was created right, to, to say to the Prime Minister this is what the people are asking for. We are asking that the government implement family-friendly laws and policies that reward families because the family is the basic unit of the society, right? And secondly, that um, the petition asks that our Prime Minister protect the Bogri law, keep the Bogri law, not change it at all, and that the, the people of Jamaica be allowed to participate by way of referendum in any proposed change. We we'll continue to pray, please pray, pray that the Bogri law is kept because we don't want homosexuality to be a part of our society. We are going as hard as we can, right? We kind of, you know, watching the court case to say what exactly we should do about it. So we have not decided completely the end figures yet, but you know, we are, we are just working as hard as we can right now. And you know, we have passed our first target, which is 25,000. So we're just, we're just continuing getting more and more signatures. What do you do when two opposite worlds collide? How big of a struggle is it though, within, within the church, especially for young people? Homosexuality? Yeah, would you say, or same-sex attraction? Yeah, same-sex attraction. Um, but I, I don't know, you know, there hasn't been a study or anything like that, but I know it is something that people struggle with, right? You know, the devil has played on us on many different levels 
right? And you know, the bottom line, he wants to kill us. And one way to do that is to, you know, to, to feed and, or to, to, to place that, those thoughts in our minds and then fool us into thinking that this is our identity. And that's a big thing with homosexuality. The devil gets people to think themselves to be, to think the sin to be part of their identity. It's a serious strategy the enemy has used. But yeah, people are being free and people are working through these feelings every day in Jamaica right now. I'm gonna ask you to look up. It's not often spoken about. It's arguably the biggest taboo subject in Jamaican churches, with many Christians pretending that the elephant in the room is invisible. But Anglican priest Father Gart Minot admits that while many Christians shy away from talking about Christians who are homosexuals, it's an issue many within the church are grappling with, including those who are leading the flock. There are a number of church leaders who um, are themselves wrestling with their own sexuality. So some of their more vocal colleagues will come out and say, you know, this is right and that is wrong and so on. Uh, but they don't necessarily speak for all their adherents because a number of them are wrestling with their sexuality and the complexities that are involved in terms of whether they need to have multiple partners, whether they need to have sex on both sides in terms of male and female. A number of church leaders are wrestling um, deeply at those levels, but dare not say anything because, you know, obviously you would be scarred and, and undermined and maligned because of what your more vocal colleagues um, are, are doing. Father Minot argues that the issue of sexuality isn't as simple as some members of the church want the public to believe. I find the discourse at a certain level to be very simplistic. And therefore, if uh, some church leaders come at the discourse uh, purely on the basis of male, female, black and white, you know, right and wrong, uh, then if that is the base on which they come to the discourse, then I'm going to suggest that that is simplistic and at best partial. Because, for example, when you talk about male and female, these are two extremes of uh, a continuum. And within these extremes, you have varieties of sexualities. So if you start on about right and wrong, at what point on the continuum are you talking about um, right and wrong? With many Christians praying for homosexuals to be saved and to turn from a lifestyle they say will see gays damned for eternity, the Anglican priest thinks that praying for homosexuals to give up their same-sex attraction is one thing, but warns Christians that they should be prepared for what God's answer may be. Praying for someone and manipulating someone are two different things. To pray for someone means that God is in control of all of life. God is in control of the life of the person. And the prayer must end as Jesus taught us, thy will be done on earth. That is God's will be done. So you pray for someone, you just pray and leave it. You don't pray and at the same time use words and expressions, etc. as a means of controlling the person. That's one. Um, you, you, the prayer is largely a, a human undertaking, a human enterprise. So therefore, when I pray, it is to ensure that we can, in the final analysis, live together in the community. So if I pray concerning your sexual orientation, and the answer to the prayer is, I have made you God, that is, God answers the prayer and says, I have made this person with this particular orientation. Hence the answer to the prayer. 
what now is going to be my response? My response has to be that I have to live with you in the community. So therefore, when we pray, we have to at the same time be open to the answer um, and, and, and in fact anticipate the answer to our prayer. He adds that praying someone out of homosexuality isn't necessarily a good thing or a practice he would agree totally with. You accept the person as they are and then you begin to work with the person. So for example, if a person comes and says, I am uncomfortable with my sexual orientation, then not even that gives me the license to pray you out of the orientation, because then I have to sit with you and talk with you to find out, well, what makes you so uncomfortable? Because based on what I said earlier, it could very well be that you're going contrary to God's plan and purpose. Um, for your life. The Anglican priest went further saying that God may actually want some people to be gay. If an individual is made in the image and likeness of God and God loves the person, then when you're praying for the person, you have to be careful that you don't pray against the will and purpose of God. In which case, if a person is made um, in such a way that his or her sexuality is oriented in a particular direction, then um, it could very well be that your prayer for the person to change is inconsistent with the plan of God. I put Father Garth Minot's theory to Catholic deacon and Christians for Truth and Justice member Maurice Saunders. What if God's plan for somebody's life is for them to be gay? Who, who are we, mere earthly beings, to be questioning that and trying to change, to change that individual? Intrinsically, I may feel that way. It doesn't mean I must live it out. You may have men, for instance, who think that they should put something in every little hole that is around. Okay? You have men who are attracted to every dress or every skirt that passes by. Does it mean that you should live out the life like that? The answer is no. And, um, and, and, and God speaks through scriptures, not just into our hearts. So if we feel that way, we need to examine ourselves, examine our consciences and ask, is that real no? Maurice Tomlinson is married to a male Canadian pastor, something he admits many Jamaicans may have a problem wrapping their heads around. A lot of Jamaicans don't understand how a divorced person can be banned from remarriage in the Anglican Church and in the Catholic Church. But the reality is interpretations of the Bible differ. <laughs> um, so some churches believe it's wrong to be to be remarried if your partner is still alive, while well, some have evolved. Some, person, some churches believe it is wrong for women to preach, aka the, the, the Roman Catholic faith, whereas others believe it is perfectly fine. So interpretations vary. My suggestion to persons who wrestle with whether you can be Christian or gay is appreciate that faith is a very personal thing, and as long as my practice of my faith doesn't harm you, there really should be no reason for us to engage in that protracted lengthy debate because my faith is a very personal thing and your faith is a personal thing and I won't challenge you to please let's not um, try to impose our views on each other. That's just not, in my view, Christian. I hesitantly say that I'm a Christian. I identify with a Christian God. Um, I don't necessarily identify with a Christian church. So, you know, others believe in Buddha, Allah, etc. I believe in God, a Christian God. I was happy to have come to the realization that it, this was not an active choice and that did not distance um, me from my spirituality, my sexuality and my spirituality coexist. At St. Andrew Parish Church in Halfway Tree, 
um, where, I, where I worshipped mostly, I became an acolyte. I served on the altar um, many a Sunday morning um, while struggling with my, my sexual identity. Um, I wouldn't take communion. Um, I would go dressed in my garb, but I wouldn't take communion. Um, just because I, you know, I, I was at a point where I did question uh, my, my sexuality was this who God wanted me to be. The reality is, I think we have shaped God in our image and our likeness. And we have limited our God. I think when we look around, I mean, even where we are sitting, there are so many different kinds of trees and shrubs, um, different kinds of grasses and weeds that are growing together. And I think that speaks loudly to the wider society. Um, look at the diversity of skin color, you know, of racial makeup, you know. So why would sexuality be an anomaly amongst that? You know, sexuality just is part of who we are, is part of our expression. I think that is all God-given. We're in an era now where people are saying that, you know, they were born that way or that is who they are. But this, the truth of the matter is that if God has created us in his image and his likeness, then if we are to say that we were born homosexuals and we're saying that God himself is a homosexual and that that is what his nature is, but how can that be God's nature when God speaks it against it specifically in the Bible? When, the, when I started to double in homosexuality, then I started to develop a desire for homosexual pornography. And so um, I got involved in that and over a period of time, the addiction became very, very, it became very, very strong. And what had happened was that my desire for women had totally disappeared. I cannot live my life on this premise, listening to the voices that I'm hearing that saying that you can continue to be this way and God, God loves you, so God will overlook. God, God will overlook you liking men. God will overlook you having desires to have sex with men, and all these things. And you will go to be with the Lord someday. It was just a moment of realness with the Lord to be like, I don't want to be like this. I cannot be like this because I won't be with you, and I'm not really into the whole thing of being separated from you for an eternity. And if you said this isn't supposed to be a part of me, then it isn't. That was where I really, really, really opened up myself to the Lord to ask him to help me to get rid of it because up until that point, I was struggling with trying to get rid of it myself. I did ask the Lord for his help and he did come and he has been helping me. The movement denied our request for an interview with Chadwick Nelson. After weeks of communication via Facebook, we were told that Chadwick had declined our invitation for an interview. We then sought the help of Family Life Ministries to help us explore the issue of reparative therapy and the efforts being made by members of the religious community to help members struggling with homosexuality. After weeks of back and forth, which included sending specific questions to an official in the organization said to be an authority on issues of homosexuality within the church, or request for the interview was refused. We then turned to clinical sexologist and psychologist Dr. Sidney McGill who has practiced reparative therapy locally for decades. Reparative therapy is, is really the practice of um, working with a client who, has, who perceives that they have um, abnormal 
issues or things that they want to overcome um, and usually it has an emotional base attached to it and so this is an attempt to try to bring them or to take them to where they think they want to be. Dr. McGill says oftentimes he's faced with cases where children are brought in to see him for various reasons. Then, during therapy, it's revealed that they have homosexual tendencies. He adds that on the other hand, several children are brought in by their parents seeking reparative help directly. And I've had a number of parents come in and say, well, I've, I've found my, my, my son watching homosexual pornography, etc. and thing. I want you to help, help them and take him out of it because me I kill him if I find if, if I that thing or turn to me now or turn him out of my house. Things like that. Now, working with a child, one of the problems I'm going to have is denial. And they're going to say, no, they're not. In fact, they'll say, if they're brave enough, some of them will say, I am bisexual. Somehow it seems better, seems more acceptable to say I'm bisexual than to say I am gay or I'm homosexual. The clinical sexologist points out that whenever a patient comes to him seeking reparative therapy, his first step is to uncover the root of the individual's homosexual inclinations. Because sexuality is such a very broad and complex thing, um, a person being homosexual may not necessarily be a genuine homosexual. In other words, there might be motives for it, there might be all sorts of reasons for it, and that person may just want to change. You might have someone who, who really is a bisexual, yes, and loves men and women almost equally, I mean sexually, and, um, and wants to be more heterosexual. Yes, um, you want to work with that person um, to improve their, you know, their, th that aspect of them. If someone has always been a homosexual, I mean, always have had homosexual relationships um, and suddenly wants to become more heterosexual because they have been, they've had a uh, conversion experience, start going to church and get saved, etc. Um, I'm, I'm not the person to, for that person to see, you know. Um, it can't be just for that's religious reasons alone. Dr. McGill says he understands why so many people, especially Christians, sing the praises of reparative therapy as there are successful cases. However, he warns that reparative therapy isn't for everyone. If someone comes to me, uh, a homosexual comes to me, and, and loves what they do, then it's fine, you know. Um, so I'm really there to serve the client. If the client comes and says, well, this is the situation. Um, if, if I'm seeing that, okay, my parents, I have to get out of this because my parents will kill me if they found out that I am, uh, you know, have same-sex attraction or I have a gay lifestyle. Um, I would think twice before I say, okay, let's begin to see how we can do a reparative thing. For Nelson, sharing his testimony with the world via YouTube is important to show Christians struggling with complex homosexual feelings that they too can overcome. I just want to say to anybody out there who is struggling with lesbianity, um, homosexuality, or even struggling with um, being a bisexual, you can be free. The church maintains that it is the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit that makes a difference. And I know uh, persons, I know a gentleman, for example, in the, from California, who at the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic across there, um, he was very much involved in the lifestyle and now he's a pastor and he's been abstinent and out of the lifestyle. Now I can't say exactly what happens in his private life, but I think there's considerable evidence that he's quite a changed person. And I not only know him, I know a number of other persons. And uh, I, I, the appeal to this is that um, the, it is the Christian life that makes a change in people. I don't think that you can be delivered from homosexuality. I think you can 
depending on what your priority is in life, you can choose to ignore it. You know, you can choose to, to serve, serve God, in, you know, and, and, and abstain from, from, you know, homosexual um, intercourse. Um, I think, however, too, that there, there are some persons who have homosexual ideation, but it is not very strong. And they grew up in a very traditional home where family is very, very important and getting married and there's a lot of pressure for them to get married. And in, in a case like that, that is easier to work on. As anticipation builds toward this historic court battle, both sides are already speaking of the major implications of the ruling, whichever way the case goes. It is a light. How bright the light will shine after the win, we don't know. But for now, it's a light. And we're going to hold on to the light. I'm confident in the democratic process. I'm confident in the principle of seeking redress when citizens like myself feel as though constitutional rights are being abridged. Um, I think it's very encouraging for Jamaicans to use this moment um, to recognize that they have, we have fundamental rights that should not, cannot be summarily dismissed or violated on the whims of, 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 of individuals or on the whims of some tyrannical majority. I don't think it will be a big battle. Um, I think the next battle might be bigger when they, they come again with a different lawsuit some years down the road. But I, I think I think, I think we will win this one and they will lick their wounds, but I don't for one minute think that it will be the end of the struggle. My end game is this. I want to live in a Jamaica where every child, regardless of their skin color, regardless of the, the, their parents' education background, regardless of their gender identity or expression, feels wanted and loved. I want to live in a Jamaica where we can recognize that we build stronger, more resilient, more stable communities when we respect each other, when we um, celebrate diversity of perspectives and opinions. I want to live in a Jamaica where we look beyond labels and stereotypes and recognize the humanity of individuals. We are in this fight till the end. No matter what the outcome, it, it just needs to be remembered that we did the very best that we could to preserve this nation from further moral decline. I think 30 years from now, history will definitely show that you know, we were fighting for something that was definitely worth fighting for. Even though we've gotten a lot of hatred, you know, a lot of cussing out you know, has taken place. But in 30 years time, we will have seen the full length to which the, gay, the, the LGBT agenda has taken it. Then they will see that what the Love March movement was doing and all the noise that we've been making and all the, the petitions that we've been getting people to sign, it was all worth it and very important for the protection of our society and the family. If I